convulsing him and crying with a loud voice came out of him. They were all amazed. And they kept on asking one another, what is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obeyed him. And once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Now you may have heard the old joke about the preacher who asked an elderly parishioner how it was with her soul. Oh, she replied, that old devil has been giving me a rough time. And immediately her husband protested. Now just hold on a minute, he said. She's not that easy to live with either. <laughs> I said it was an old joke, right? <laughs> the exorcism in today's lesson, the casting out of the demon, in Je is Jesus' first miracle in the Gospel of Mark. Mark doesn't offer us the water to wine miracle at the wedding feast in Cana like the other Gospels do. And that's because, for Mark, this story, this miracle, this casting out is Jesus' ministry in a nutshell. And it is also our discipleship in a nutshell. We are to preach, using words if necessary, and to cast out demons by virtue of our baptisms. There are lots of ways it can happen Members of St. Anna's Episcopal Church near New Orleans' French Quarter got so fed up with gun violence, they created what they call a murder board. It started several years ago, and once a week, Father Bill Terry goes out, and he makes additions to the four-by-eight-foot board, which is posted outside the church. And the additions he makes go like this. January 6th, he and Esther, 11 years old, shot. January 7th, Eric Robinson, 41 years old, shot and burned. January 8th, Joseph Elliott, 17, shot. January 10th, Tiffany Frey, 36, shot. January 12th, Keyshawn Keppard, 20, shot. It makes a difference hearing their names, doesn't it? The church created the murder board to cast out the demons of fear, of complacency, that urge us to tune out, to numb ourselves to urban violence, and to render the victims anonymous. Father Bill said, we tend to talk in terms of numbers, the murder rate, how many murders, but it has a dehumanizing quality and we're in the business of humanity. He said the murder board intends to ask the question that a grieving mother once asked of him, why did my baby have to die? Now, it might surprise you to know that the Children's Defense Fund ranks the United States dead last among industrialized nations in protecting our children from gun violence. They say that in the U.S., a child or teenager is killed every three hours by a firearm, and that a child is killed by abuse or neglect every six hours. A priest I know who serves as a violence prevention coordinator in a hospital in Chicago told me that she sees young people every day who already have their burial clothes picked out. As Christians, the way we respond to violence is by trying to be as nonviolent as we possibly can in our lives, in our communications, our actions, our work, by casting out whatever demons we can. For example, later this month, Holy Innocence Episcopal Church in Atlanta will hold an all-night prayer vigil, vigil, reading the names of all the children the holy innocents murdered in the city last year. Hundreds and hundreds of names. 
This effort is about the power of prayer and about claiming that those lives might be lost to us, but they live on in resurrected life, Reverend Allison told me. They're not just lives lost, they have a home, a place where they rest in peace. What we can do as church is to pray, to worship, and to remember. It's our job to hold that out for people to see what God might be calling them to do, she said. The first step in anything we do as Christians is to see how God might be calling us to behave, to act differently. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Similarly, a young man named Martis, who lives in Racine, Wisconsin, told me that St. Luke's Church there changed his life. Martis is a boxer, a musician, and an ex-felon, who until a few years ago had no job prospects and even less hope. A former teacher sent him to St. Luke's vocational ministry classes, and Martis has been on the fast track ever since. He's been promoted twice, and he manages retail operations at a nonprofit fair trade store. None of it would have happened, he says, had he not signed up for St. Luke's job readiness classes. Martis said, St. Luke's helped me realize I was worth the effort they were making to help me. They also helped me forgive myself for doing stuff to be incarcerated. There's very little you can say about yourself right after incarceration that makes you feel good, he said. But without St. Luke's, I'd still be struggling to find even temporary work. I don't think employment is St. Luke's specialty, he said. People are their specialty. This is what Jesus is all about feeding souls, healing souls, exorcising souls, loving souls. Because the truth is, our souls are assaulted most of the time from all sides with all sorts of demons, institutional demons like racism and sexism, economic injustice. And there are the personal demons of addiction, depression, hatred, resentment, guilt. And then there are the even more subtle demons, our need for conformity, security, popularity. Our souls begin perfect and whole. And as we grow and develop, the separation between what's going on inside of us and what's going on outside of us begins. Now, some of this separation is normal, but the greater the separation, the more the need for healing. My husband, Keith, tells me that there is a ceremony in Japanese culture that acknowledges a woman on her 47th birthday and a man at his 52nd birthday. It is called the celebration of the hard luck year. And this was done long before there was any identification of such a thing as a midlife crisis. But both the midlife crisis and the hard luck year celebration point to the need for a graceful moment to redefine who we are and to find joy in ourselves and in where we are. As Christians, we are called to regular self-examination and redefinition. Every Sunday, there is a pregnant pause before we begin the confession. The silence is there for a reason to give us time for self-examination, time to confess our sins, to redefine ourselves, to take care of our souls, to remember with joy that we are God's beloved. We have joy when we take care of our souls as well as the souls of others. And it doesn't mean fixing or saving or advising or setting straight or correcting anybody else. It means acknowledging the mystery of another human being. It means listening, really listening to one another without prejudging. Because the truth is, we can listen one another's souls into wholeness. 
What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. In all those crowds of people surrounding him, did you notice that only the unclean spirit recognizes Jesus for who he really is? Mark's gospel was written thousands of years ago, but we know that evil is still with us. The demons we are called to cast out are the forces of the culture that destroy the spirit and attack the soul. I am talking about class, about poverty, about race, about so many things so huge. It ought to outrage us, but instead it's a small story on page eight in the local newspaper. This is at the heart of our baptismal vows, to respect the dignity of every human being. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Well, here's another question for us today. Are our actions, our behaviors, the way we treat others different because we know the Holy One of God? There is an ancient Native American legend about a chief, and I'm sure this may be familiar to all of you, but I think it helps point to what I'm trying to get at today. So this chief is trying to impart wisdom to two young men about the struggle within each one of us. And he says that it is like two wolves fighting inside of us. There is one good wolf who wants to do the right, and the other wolf who always wants to do the wrong. Sometimes the good wolf seems stronger and is winning the fight, but sometimes the other wolf is stronger and wrong is winning. Well, the young man asks the chief, who is going to win in the end? And the chief replied, the wolf you feed. Amen. <laughs>